Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on May 16th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And today we're going to talk about Warm Mineral Springs. It's a small but important body of water in southern Sarasota County in the city of Northport. And my guests will be experts about its history, its water, its archaeology, its caves, and its biology. And later on in the show, we're going to bring on more guests to talk about a proposal by the city of Northport for development near warm mineral sp springs or potential development. So I hope you stay tuned for the whole show and let people know that you, you can tune in to 88.5 FM or WMNF Tampa. And I'm wondering if you've been there and what your experience was like at warm mineral springs. You can email or text to DJ at WMNF.org or you can call 81 or text that is 813-433-0885. And I have three guests joining me live right now. Kurt Bowen is joining us by phone and he is traveling. So apologies in advance if we have connection issues. Kurt is a master photographer, video producer, and has photographed warm mineral springs while scuba diving. A link to some of his underwater videos on WMNF.org later in the day. So welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Kurt. I'm not sure if we're hearing Kurt, but... Uh... Oh, I think I have to put his, sorry about that. Kurt, can you hear us now? I'm trying. You I'm sound in the middle. You sound great. So I appreciate you joining us. And we're going to go now to our uh, talk and to introduce our other two guests as well. We're also joined by a voice that will be familiar to WMNF listeners. You may have heard her sub for Bobby yesterday afternoon. It's Patty Metz. She's a substitute music DJ. Patty is a hydrologist and wrote a major analysis of Warren Mineral Springs for the USGS in 2016. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Patty. Hi, Sean. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we have some information about our third guest, who is Steve Kosky. He has knowledge about the historical archaeological and paleontological significance of warm mineral springs. He previously was an assistant underwater archaeologist for the FSU State, Florida State University administered warm mineral springs archaeological research project. And he was a resident underwater archaeologist, land manager, and former research associate at the University of Miami owned Little Salt Spring Research Facility. So welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Steve. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. I'm glad you could join us. Steve is currently the Sarasota County Archaeologist with Sarasota County Libraries and Historical Resources and Administrator of Sarasota County's Historic Preservation Ordinance. And even though that's the case, Steve does not have jurisdiction in Northport, which has its own preservation or, or uh, ordinance. So welcome to all three of you. And I can't wait to share your experiences about warm mineral springs with our audience. So let's start with our hydrogeologist, Patty. Many people may not have ever visited Warm Mineral Springs. Tell us where it is and what it's like. Well, it's in Sarasota County, and it's Northport, city of Northport, and um, it's not far from Tampa, <laughs> about an hour's drive. So what is that the springs like? What does it look like from the surface? And I don't know if you've ever been inside of it. What does it look like under underwater? Well, Warm Mineral Springs is a... Uh, collapse sinkhole, and uh, it's about 240 or so feet wide at the surface, and it drops down to uh, 205 feet, and there's a debris cone inside, and along the walls of the the um, sinkhole are flow stones, and um, that it gives us an, an indication that there used to be water flowing down and uh, through time it has become a spring as water flows upward um uh, and if i can interrupt when you say water flowing down does that kind of indicate that at one point that area was dry and there was water dripping down the walls of a cave is that kind of what you mean yes about twelve thousand years ago the outline of florida was a lot wider than it is today and uh, numerous um, sinkholes formed and cracks and crevices uh, occurred on, the, on the, um, the surface, and it was formed by erosional processes. So way back when uh, these sinkholes formed lakes in the interior and along the coast, they became springs. So way back when uh, there were it was a sinkhole and water flowed downward. 
and about 40 feet along the cave's uh, ledge, you'll see, a, um, excuse me, you'll see a ledge about 40 feet. And um, Steve will talk about what we have found along that ledge. And um, also at the bottom, uh, there's a lot of cracks and fissures and a number of caves that um, Kurt will talk about. He's, di he's dived those caves extensively, and he can give us more of an indication of what they looked like. Our guest is Patty Metz, who is a hydrogeologist, and we also will bring on, as she mentioned, Kurt Bowen and Steve Kosky in just a minute to talk about the archaeology, the history, and the, the cave diving that's there at Warm Mineral Springs in Sarasota County. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. So before I get to our other guests, Patty, why don't you tell us why it's called Warm Mineral Springs? What's warm about it and why is why mineral? Okay, we have to get a little in depth with hydrogeology. Um, along the center of the state, we call that a recharge area and water flows down. And as we get toward the coast, water flows up. So that's the groundwater flow path goes from east to west in, in a groundwater basin. And as it moves from the east to the west, it heats up and it also heats up from um, surface on down. And it's usually about one degree per hundred feet. And um, we've tested wells at about uh, 1,200 feet and the temperature is about 100 degrees. So we were able to figure that uh, water came from deep sources, also looking at the high mineralized content. You can see from the Aovan Park Formation that um, water flows up from this zone and it mixes with cooler water and at the spring it, it comes up at 85 degrees. What causes it to heat as it gets lower as it as it uh, in deeper water why is that hotter? Well as you move down into the earth you it gets warmer. Um, you can get you know the, the central core of the earth is a big magma center so you as you move down into the earth, it water heats up. And so when I go to a spring that's cool, that's, I don't know, 72 degrees Fahrenheit, it's just because the water is coming from a, a yes, closer a to the surface? Yes, a shallower source, probably like uh, maybe 300 feet down and some even shallower. Our guest is Patty Metz, who is a hydrogeologist, and we're talking about warm mineral springs. And let's bring on photographer and di a photographer and diver now, Kurt Kurt Bowen. He has shared with me a video that he took in 2015 from a dive in warm mineral springs, and he was at a depth of about 212 feet in what's called Hot Vent B, and we're going to put a link to that video on WMNF.org so you can watch that. But I want to talk ask you, Kurt. Can you describe what it was like to dive 200 feet deep in Warm Mineral Springs? What did you see? Well, Warm Mineral Springs, first of all, is a very unique site. There's only two geological sites on the eastern United States, and one of them being Warm Mineral Springs. Um, what's unique about it is obviously the water temperature. And the cave on the bottom starts at basically the big sinkhole that has a warm vent on the bottom and the, and the water temperature coming out of the cave at 212 is about 99 degrees. <clears throat> and that water goes into what I call a, a fracture layer. It, the cave continues to the north for a distance about 150 to 200 feet. It's down to a depth of 224 feet. At 224, it fractures into smaller uh, cave system that you can't fit to, you know, it's too small. So at that particular point, we don't know where the water comes from, if it comes from deeper or if it continues in that fracture zone at 220. Have we ever sent robotic cameras or anything down there to, to kind of explore what goes beyond where the humans can go? I think it's too small. It's all just a fracture zone. Well, that is the voice of Kurt Bowen, who's an archaeologist and historian. We're talking about warm mineral springs, and we're going to get back and talk a little bit more about what's down deep in and underwater in warm mineral springs. 
But I also want to bring in our other guest, where we, we want to talk now about the history and archaeology from our expert, Steve. So Steve Kosky, how do we know the warm mineral spring sinkhole formed more than 12,000 years ago? What's the evidence that we have, especially the archaeological evidence? Well, as Patty mentioned, warm mineral springs, like little salt spring, are ceiling collapse sinkholes. Um, while they may have opened up between 18 and 25,000 years ago, or even more, it took them hundreds of thousands of years to form because of the dissolving of limestone in contact with uh, tannic or carbonic acids in the water. So it takes a long time to make these um, um, channels uh, underwater. Um, what's fascinating about warm mineral springs, and I had the pleasure of working with Sonny Parko from February of 1986 to 1990 um, is just its uh, persistence. So it collapses 18 to 25,000 years ago. And I don't know, uh, Patty, if we don't really know when it actually opened up. You can core uh, the cone on the bottom and the cone on the bottom is, is over 100 feet, uh, the silt cone and get to the uh, lowest levels and radiocarbon date, some of the uh, wood, uh, but it would be difficult to you know, give an accurate assessment. Um, but it's really a fascinating uh, site, both in its prehistory, its history, its research history, and its development history. And I could go and discuss a little bit about, uh, based on my, exposure and how I got involved uh, with that, if you'd like to uh, have any, ask any questions on that. Yeah, let's talk, uh, let's start with the prehistory. What do we know? Um, so I learned from Patty's paper in from for the USGS that during the late Pleistocene, maybe about 12,000 years ago, the surf, the, the water level was about 100 feet below the modern spring pool surface. So there was 100 feet of, you know, just like a, almost a sheer drop and, but then they and they know that based on plant material and radiometric dating of human remains. So why what's the significance of 100 feet below this modern spring pool? What did we find there, especially when it comes to human remains? Well, um, when you uh, just a brief background, when you lower the uh, oceans because of the glacial period, the water gets sucked up in the glaciers, you lower sea level. When you lower sea level, you lower the water table. When you lower the water table, the water just goes down and stays at its hydrostatic uh, head or, or pressure. So it, it's all related to the pressure of the subsurface. Uh, so these are persistent geological features through time and they became landmarks. They're both warm mineral mineral salts are uh, eligible as national historic landmarks. And both uh, for their uh, um, natural, but also their, their historic uh, background. So let's say uh, 10,000 years ago is about 11,500 calendrical years. Uh, warm mineral springs and little salt springs, the climate was much different, cooler, drier. Uh, no uh, Peace River, no Lake Okeechobee, uh, um, the Everglades were uh, a forest, and uh, and and our coast was over 150 miles offshore, based on the continental shelf. So, um, so you had these features that were predictable uh, for procuring resources. And in the winter or cool days, when you walked up to warm mineral springs and little salt, it would be billowing uh, like a smoke chimney. The, the steam that that warm water creates in contact with the cold air, and it can be seen for miles. It actually looks like a, a fire uh, burning when you, when you see it on the landscape. And even today in the morning, you'll drive by Trifano or Ortiz and you'll see this billowing steam coming out. And depending on air pressure and things, it could be traveling across the landscape. So these were areas that were known, uh, predictable, and also they gave glimpses into the underworld. Uh, so they were sacred and special. So the first people that came to Warm Mineral Springs were uh, at a minimum of 11,500 years ago. People talk about 10,000 year old man at Warm Mineral Springs. 
yes, but uh, uh, 10,000 calibrated years is over 11,000 years. So, so we have to rethink our age. So people were coming here, uh, coming to Warm Mineral Springs as early as 11,500 years ago and to collect resources and to access the underworld. And Warm Mineral Springs became, so some believe, an actual cemetery where people interred their dead. And in 1958, in 58, 59, uh, the first person to die of Warm Mineral Springs was Eugenie Clark, who was an ichthyologist. And she came to Warm Mineral Springs to uh, catch, catch tarpon, blind tarpon that were known for Warm Mineral Springs. Little Salt Spring had three uh, as well. The last one I've seen was in 19, 2007, when the last three foot blind tarpon disappeared. Um, so so uh, the next person who shortly followed Eugenie, and I'm not sure if Eugenie told Bill or Bill asked Eugenie, uh, somebody told Bill and Bill was uh, Colonel William Royal was an explorer. Uh, he was in the military. He was, he rode sharks. He, uh, he was a perfect person to, well, uh, uh, to explore on mineral springs. And what you see when you descend over that 13 foot uh, ledge is a wall of, like Patty said, uh, flow stone, sheet stone that comes from water seeping in over millennia. Uh, so the water level was low for thousands of years. That water uh, seeps, percolates over the sides, and it creates these flow stones, which are like broad stalactites. So you drop down 13, 15, 18 feet, and you go under the flow stone, and you're in this cavernous ledge with stalactites. And it's, it's like, people ask me, well, what's it like under there? And Kurt may agree. Or, uh, it's like being on the dark side of the moon. There's little to no ambient light and, uh, and you're just in a whole nother world. When Bill, when Colonel Royal started diving there, he observed those stalactites and he knew enough. Uh, uh, he was a smart man. He knew enough to know that stalactites only grow in uh, dry environments. And he speculated that these uh, caverns were open at least 10 to 12,000 years ago. And when he started to explore the sediments, he started to find artifacts. And in addition to those artifacts, he found the extinct Pleistocene megafauna. Uh, I believe he was the one that found the saber cat. And the saber cat, Smilodon fatalis, uh, was a beast that was around in the late Pleistocene. And it, this is a, a, a life-size model. They were a little bigger than our African lions today. And let me inter and, uh, interrupt Steve for just a second to, to point out to our radio listeners that he was holding a skull, uh, maybe twice the size of a human skull of a, a giant cat with maybe six inch or four inch long fangs. And so this cyber cat used to live in Florida. And, and as well as other extinct animals. Here we have a uh, beanie baby woolly mammoth. And uh, this isn't quite to scale like the saber cat, uh, but I could give you a list of, of, of Pleistocene mammals that became extinct during the Pleistocene. And uh, there were uh, mammoths, mastodons, uh, saber cat, glyptodonts, giant armadillos, a variety of species of ground sloth. So when Bill Royal started finding these things, he found a human skeleton. Um, and he speculated that because that human skeleton was on that 40 foot ledge, that it must be at least 10,000 years. And uh, over a period of time, uh, he, did, he did some damage to the spring, of course, when you find an archeological site and you start digging it up, especially when there's human remains on it, it's, you know, I mean, it's exciting, but it's shocking because of the scientific evidence that you're removing. Um, Bill tried to get a number of scientists to come in and look at them, and some did. None of them believed that the specimens were uh, more than a few thousand years old. Um, but then Bill found a, 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 a human remains, and human remains are protected under Florida Statutes, uh, uh, Florida Statute 872. It's a third degree felony to disturb human remains, intentionally disturb human remains, or uh, excavate in sites that have human remains. Uh, but back then, in the in the late 50s, early 60s, there were no uh, laws and regulations on that. 
So what he uh, uh, did and found with Eugenie Clark was a, uh, a, what was believed to be a burial, human remains, and in that uh, cranium was a shrunken brain. And, uh, and generally speaking, archeologists don't like to show as a matter of respect to Native Americans, uh, uh, human remains and things, but Bill, we have a video of Bill looking in that cranium and what, shaking it, wondering what was in it. And it turned out to be uh, a shrunken human brain. So that was the first time that preservation, the uh, preservation of anaerobic uh, geothermal water, similar to little salt, only it's not geothermal. Uh, you get this phenomenal, phenomenal present uh, preservation. Anaerobic water, constant environment, uh, in sealed in peat or sand are great uh, facilitators. So, so you have this, uh, and that was radiocarbon dated at 10,200 uh, radiocarbon years BP, which is over 11,000 years. And that was then published, that date was published um, in American Antiquity uh, in 1960 under the title, Human Brain from Warm Mineral Springs, Florida. And that uh, human burial was the oldest human remains ever found in the Western Hemisphere at that time. So it was a phenomenally uh, significant and important find because no one, uh, even uh, the Smithsonian scientists, believed that the antiquity of, of humanity went back uh, 10 to 12,000 years in the New World. So that was, that was really a, a huge discovery. I want to remind people that you're listening to Tuesday Cafe, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. That's the voice of Steve Kosky, an archaeologist and a historian with Sarasota County. And we're talking about warm mineral springs in that county and the importance of, of what's, uh, what's going on there. Later on in the show, we'll bring on some more guests. I want to go, I want to ask you one, one question here, Steve, before we move on. The, the human remains that were found in the 50s in warm mineral springs at the, on that ledge underneath the water, it, there's, is it known that that was a burial site or could it have been someone who fell into the sinkhole and just by accident? Do, you, do we know anything about that? That's a really good uh, question, um, Sean, because the first, the, the first archaeologist that, that uh, Bill brought in really poo-pooed his discoveries at, at Warm Mineral Springs and Little Salt, thinking that they couldn't possibly, he staged it. Uh, he would just happen to dive with a TV crew and, and find a, 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 a burial. So no one believed him, but the first state underwater archeologist and professional to dive and actually play some credence was Carl Clausen, who was the first underwater archeologist who then went to uh, the state underwater archeologist who then went to Little Salt. Uh, that was in 1971. In 19, late 1971, the second state underwater archaeologist, Wilburn Sonny Carco, came and started diving. Um, Clausen believed that all those human remains were the result of incidental uh, falling in, getting eaten by alligators. Um, what Sonny uh, Demon wanted to demonstrate and demonstrate it. And if you want to read the two, Clausen has a 1975 article on warm mineral springs. Sonny's article came out in Science. Uh, uh, no, Sonny's article came out in uh, uh, Archaeology of Eastern North America, uh, I believe, in 1979. I've, I've got all those references. But Sonny believed that they were actual intentional burials. Now, whether he believed that it was the ledge was the water was below, and people were entering the cavern and interring the dead. And burial one that he excavated, it was a uh, extended burial. It was like eighty something percent complete, and uh, and he believed that that was an intentional burial, and not only. Uh, was it nearly complete, complete, but it was buried with uh, a shell that was a spur for an atlatl or a spear throw. And an atlatl is a spear throwing implement that extends the arm and has a hook on the end. And you can apply a dart or harpoon or, uh, and load 
the app level. And this instrument would increase 100 times the force distance that you could get from just a regular spear. So it revolutionized uh, uh, procurement. And some people th say they were hunting mammoths with them. So, so Carco believes that uh, um, there were uh, intentional interments. Clausen believes they were fallen. Clausen was only there for two weeks. Sonny spent seasons there. So the general consensus is that um, it was a uh, an intentional uh, burial ground for a few individuals, up to 13, maybe 15, depending on uh, minimal uh, numbers. And uh, and I would think to, to, to believe uh, Sonny, since I worked with him, since I knew him. And uh, so then it, then it leads, is, is it a mortuary pond where people burying their dead on the ledge when it had some water on it? Or was it a cemetery? Uh, as Little Salt Spring is an actual mortuary pond where they would intentionally bury under mar underwater in peat. So I know that was a long answer, but that's all I got. Well, thank you for that answer, Steve. And I promise to let you go around 1030. So uh, unless there's something you'd like to add, I'll say thank uh, you and we'll continue with our other guests. I'm Is good. If there's any questions, if you have questions and answers, and I'm good, I don't mind sitting in, John. All right. Sounds great. Well, why don't we keep with you? And I want to take my, uh, I'm going to bring in a couple of new guests in just a moment, but while we have uh, our, our diver on the, on the air, we have photographer and diver Kurt Bowen joining us by phone. And I wanted to ask you, Kurt, whether you've seen any of these areas that might've been where the, this either intentional uh, burial was, or, or whether it was an accidental, you know, I, I can't say that I know anything about this more than what Steve added. Have you been to these areas and, and what, what is it like? Can you describe what you saw there? Uh, yes, I've been to those areas. And <clears throat> for somebody to actually fall into that, it's, you would have to fall down and then undercut. It's undercut underneath the ledge, you know, 12, 15 feet. So for somebody to actually fall into that zone would be virtually impossible, in my opinion. And I also want to ask you, Kurt, that you you took a you shared with me the video that you took in 2015 from War Mineral Springs, but there was also inset in that video was was one from 1996. So in those intervening 19 years, was there any change that you saw down 200 feet or so down deep in in War Mineral Springs? No, I don't think anything changes down there. That uh, maybe that's good news to know that there's uh, not that much disturbing, at least the bottom there. Um, well, I want to thank you, and you're welcome to stay on, or or if you need to leave, you can leave. Uh, that is Kurt Bowen, who is a photographer and diver. But right now, I want to bring on a new guest, and that is Debbie McDowell, who is a commissioner with the city of Northport, and uh, and we have also Stephanie Gibson, who is part of City Watch Northport, Florida, who watches the city government there. So I want to welcome both of you, Debbie McDowell, Commissioner with the City of Northport, and Stephanie Gibson with City Watch Northport, Florida. Thank you for, for joining us. If you can unmute yourselves and, and hello. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank so, you very much. I'm glad you could join us because we're we're going to change turn now. We've already described what for our listeners what warm mineral springs is and maybe why it's important. And now we're going to talk about today and the future, what we're what we're seeing. So let's start with Commissioner Debbie McDowell. What's the city of Northport's relationship with Warm Mineral Springs? Does it own and control and kind of have to pay for upkeep there? So the city of Northport owns and operates now um, Warm Mineral Springs. Um, we have had complete ownership for hmm, 2015, 2016. And we had a management company to manage the day-to-day -day operations. Hurricane Ian shut the springs down because of some serious damage to the buildings. We have since opened up the springs back in April 7th. Um, so visitors can still can go to the springs again. Um, now it's fully open, but it's being operated by, by our Parks and Rec staff. And there's been uh, the city is trying to pursue or may pursue a public private partnership to restore three historic buildings that are on the site there and to develop adjacent property 
And so lately the city has been considering four different routes or four different options when it comes to development of warm mineral springs. Can you kind of in general tell us about those four options? You know, we don't need a lot of specifics, but how do they how do those four options differ? So I think the four options differ based on intensity. Um, do we want it to be fully developed? And when I say fully developed, I want to differentiate two different areas. So the city of Northport owns approximately 80 acres. Um, 20 of those acres is warm mineral springs, the water, the buildings, the cycle Rama, the parking lot, that general area and buffering of conservation. So that's 20 acres. That is what we are trying to fix the buildings up and, and be able to have it a beautiful destination. Um, right now it is, admittedly, it's an eyesore. It, it's being run out of um, a modular unit. Um, there's fencing all around it. It is not pretty when you go there until you get to the springs and the water is extremely relaxing and the area around it is very nice. But when you see it, you go, wow, this is a city asset, it's, it's embarrassing. But then we have another 60 acres that is adjacent to that 20 acres that is parkland. It hasn't been touched, it's pristine land. Um, it, it has a creek that runs through it. So we, we initially were planning to fix the buildings um, ourselves as a city. We put out, we saved up about $9 million, went out to bid. The sole bidder came back with an $18 million bid, um, a response to that bid. And of course, the city doesn't have that kind of money um, at that time. And we said, now what are we going to do? So we we elicited the help of a P3. We had a P3 come forward and say, this is our plan. Another P3 came forward and said, this is our plan. Well, we chose the one um, through Warm Mineral Springs Development Group, and they gave us a concept plan. Well, the concept plan is that they will fix the buildings, they'll do the parking lot, they'll do everything we wanted to do in phase one, and they want to get some return on that investment by developing phase two, which is that 60 acres of parkland. So back to your question is the different options. So option one was not intensive. Um, option two was very minimally intensive. Option three was kind of an in-between. And option four was highly intensive. Um, I leaned towards the least intensive possible, which very much mirrored what our um, master plan that we approved back in 2019 to keep it parkland. Yes, we are going to have to build some things on it. You know, nature trails, we had um, a museum planned, an amphitheater of sorts planned. We had some um, high above the trees um, scaping so that you could climb up and see the vastness because it's very close to Deer Prairie Creek and Chewy Ranch. So you could see this natural beauty that you can see from the air. Um, and that's where I was leaning. My colleagues was leaning towards more intensive and, and development of a resort and some residential components to it. Okay, we'll put in a, a museum and the developer would, would have like hiking trails and zip lining and stuff in the center to have it accessible that area to the general public. To me, when the city purchased it, they purchased it to have it all available to the public, um, that 60 acres. The, the 20 acres is available to the public, but it has an admission fee attached to it. So there's a, a difference of opinions up on the dais. Um, I firmly believe there are two ways you can approach economic development. You can pave over every square inch and have a few little hiking trails, or you can do what we what we have seen done here in the county, Sarasota County, with uh, the Mayaka, Hatch, Mayaka State Park and Oscar Shearer State Park, where it is an economic driver. And I shared some statistics that a citizen shared with me, and I was unaware of, of how much those two state parks in Sarasota County bring to our county directly 
the direct economic impact those two state parks bring is over $39 million a year. And it creates over 500 jobs. And, and they have an attendance of close to a half a million people that come to a state park, which is designed to be preserved and parkland. We would get far more economic Dr driven benefit if we keep it a parkland. And I shared other scenarios, and I know this isn't the Debbie show, so I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, our guest is Debbie McDowell, a commissioner with the city of Northport. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. We also have on the line who I'll bring in now Stephanie Gibson, who is part of City Watch Northport, Florida. And Stephanie, you've done some uh, some public records requests that I've gotten that have that have been shared with me. So I know a lot more about the process because of the the documents that you've shared with me. And you were talking to me before the show about uh, this a process to determine what was to be done with Warm Mineral Springs. Is that the 2019 master plan that Commissioner McDowell was talking about? I think it's in general the whole P3 process, which kind of was born out of no money. And I'm sorry uh, to interrupt I, you for I a second, of, but both of you have mentioned P3, and our listeners may or may not know what that is. That stands for public private partnership. So uh the, the private company kind of paying for the development of this and getting some of the proceeds back from it. So that's what P3 is. Go ahead. I'm that, sorry. That's to right. And so I I've I've been really interested to see where this P3 goes. I'm not completely opposed to a P3. But like everybody else, I, I'm really opposed to the heavy development and the walls were hitting. Um, the present commissioner excluded. The process has been very murky, been very, um, I'll use the word shaded. A lot of decisions happening not inside the public, which concerns me. If it was a, um, if it was a sound plan and idea, there's no reason why we can't have full and open disclosure in the public and those discussions. I think the biggest concern I have right now is we had another opportunity to get that those revenues through the Florida Outstanding Springs designation, and our city hall stepped into that process and stopped it without a discussion. There may be valid reasons. I just don't know. I've, I've read the report, but it's pretty Greek to me. I would have liked to have heard the discussion. So I, I'm really looking at that from the very beginning. I think right up front, probably the the biggest question was, is, is this public-private partnership a qualifying project to be looking at on a parkland? And um, that was a very uh, controlled conversation on the commission, which made me nervous. So I probably tuned in a little closer because of that. Um, and I, again, I, I, I don't think the developers have any, any want to come in there and ruin those springs. Obviously, that's their bread and butter is to earn that. What I see though, is us trying to give away city assets with a very little in turn so far. So that's kind of where I'm in on it. That's the voice of Stephanie Gibson, who is part of City Watch Northport, Florida. We are also have on the line, Debbie McDowell, a commissioner with the city of Northport. We still have our hydrogeologist, Patty Metz, and some others from the beginning of the show, which we might get back to as, as we go on with the show. Let me read it, just a couple of quick emails here. Um, Janet writes in and says, I've been to those springs and they're fantastic people from all over the world, especially Eastern Europe, go there for the water's healing properties. It's such a unique place and I hope the development doesn't ruin it. And then David writes in, he says, I want to thank WMNF for covering this story, which has immense cultural and historical significance. I'm also extremely concerned with the misuse of the P3 statute, which was created for infrastructure and other clear public use projects. This condominium and hotel proposal clearly violates the intent of the P3 statute. So thank you for, to, to David for that, that comment. And let me ask, um, so Stephanie, you mentioned the this um, this proposal, there was a proposal in the Florida legislature to add warm mineral springs to a list of outstanding Florida springs. But in those public records documents that you released that shows that the Northport city manager determined it would be best to pause the pursuit of the designation as an outstanding spring because he had concerns about the impact of a public-private partnership and on future development in other areas of your city. So what did you take that to mean? Well, the whole idea of going to the P3 is because we didn't have the money. If there is a revenue stream that will do two things, provide dollars to improve the springs 
and to preserve and protect the springs, it's a viable option that we should put on the table and discuss. Now, there, and again, because it hasn't been discussed publicly, uh, how do we know that that's the best choice? And, and how does the city manager in this case make that decision for 80,000 people? That's not the way this government is supposed to run. We're supposed to do it in the sunshine, put everything on the table, and that seems to not be happening on this particular process. Um, again, I think it, it could be all on the up and up, then just do it in the public and then make your decision and move on. But I think there's being, they're, they're hiding things or suppressing things and intervening in places that they have zero business being in um, that is, could, cost, could cost the citizens of Northport. That's the voice of Stephanie Gibson, a resident of Northport, who is a close monitor of the city government there. We also have on a commissioner with the city of Northport, Debbie McDowell. So Debbie, uh, not to pile on to the city manager, but there's been a lot of discussion in, in the commission, in the city commission at Northport about this manager, and there may even be kind of a hearing into, into his actions. What can you tell us about that, Debbie? So because of the city manager making the designation to pause the um, seeking of the state outstanding spring designation for Warm Mineral Springs and Little Salt Springs, I was quite taken aback by that decision. I, I The commission unanimously approved requesting this designation. Um, back in December of 2022, because it had a lot of benefits to have this designation. And when I found out that it was paused and the commission didn't have the opportunity to weigh in on it, uh, that concerned me deeply. Um, I did file a formal complaint, not just on that, that specific item, but others. Um, following the process that is outlined, um, I was told that only the city commission can um, handle performance-based um, issues with the city manager, who is a charter officer. So I took it to my board and said, hey, these are some concerns I have. And a vote of four to one was they moved it to a meeting on June 6th for discussion. So I am looking forward to that discussion on June 6th and ha have it get a better understanding as to how that decision was made outside of the commission's purview. I read in the Sarasota Herald Tribune that you thought waiting till June 6th might be just taking this too long. It, you could you could maybe even make a decision even sooner. Well, uh, I'm sure everybody that's listening has been either an employer or an employee, and when there are um, personnel issues, you don't wait a month to address them. You you take the bull by the horns and you address them when the time at that moment. You don't wait a month, and I don't think that it is in anybody's best interest, mine, even the city manager's best interest to have this put on pause for a whole month. But the commission does not work as individuals. We work as a commission body and the commission four to one said, yes, we're gonna wait until June 6th. That's Debbie McDowell, a commissioner with the city of Northport. And you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. We also have on Zoom with us Stephanie Gibson, part of City Watch Northport, Florida. We're talking about warm mineral springs in Sarasota County. Earlier, we were talking about the plan that was that presented by a private developer to develop this this area, renovate some of the uh, the areas, but also to create a resort hotel and spa and some residential areas. Now I'm looking at a, a document that's called the Warm Mineral Springs Enclave Conceptual Site Plan, and it was made by a company called Insight. Is that kind of the 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 what you're going with as well? And and maybe if so, you could describe what are these destination residential areas? How many units are we talking about? And I have the same question about the resort hotel and spa. So, um, Sean, the the residential component, I believe, is like 300 units, um, and the resort is over another 100 units. It, it's quite an intensive. Um, it, the residential units aren't intended to be single family. They're intended to be like 
a apartment condo kind of thing where they would sell the unit and the purchaser could live in it year round. The purchaser could live in it for a few months. Uh, then the management company of that um, residential component would then be able to rent out that unit, kind of like a vacation rental home, um, on that 60 acres, along with the resort on that 60 acres. And you, you also have to understand that it's not just the resort, it's not just the residential component, it's everything that's associated with that, the roads that get in, the parking lot, the, the area for trash pickup, um, stormwater removal. Um, it, it creates more, in, more concrete on land that could generate far more economic benefit if you left it as a park. Um, how many people go to New York City to, to go to a resort? But how many people go to New York City because they want to see Central Park? And I, I use that analogy when we were discussing about Orminal Springs back, back in the days when they were developing New York City. The developer said, we have got to have a place in this metropolis where people can go and unwind and relax and, and get away from everything that is what New York City represents back then. We don't know the true value today because we're just looking through it with the optics of dollars and cents today. It's going to be an economic driver. It's going to help our tax base. Why don't we look at it as what it could be generationally for years to come? And there's a a right, right way and a wrong way of doing that. And I, I firmly believe that if Northport is going to continue on the path of development, that it's slated to be 250,000 people, there is going to be a need for having green space and escape space, a place where families can go and unwind and people can go to visit. And Warm Middle Springs is that gem. A lot of people don't go to Warm Middle Springs now, but I think a lot of people would go to Warm Middle Springs if it had other park-like amenities added to that 60 acres. We don't need to plow down all of it and put in more concrete. I, I, I equate this gem of Warm Middle Springs to be the gem of New York City Central Park. That's the voice of Debbie McDowell, a commissioner with the city of Northport. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. I'm Sean Canan. We also have on the line Stephanie Gibson, who watches the city government of Northport. And I want to bring back our hydrogeologist, Patty Metz, to answer a question about the, the commissioner McDowell had talked about this plan for the private part, public partnership, perhaps pouring a lot of concrete on this land and I'm assuming that would really impact the water, the hydrology there and the, the water quality. So Patty Metz, what can you tell us about what might happen with the water quality there or what the water quality is like now and, and what might change? And Patty, you might be muted. Okay. Um, I'm not a builder. <laughs> But I can speak about the geology. There's a, okay, there's a huge fracture system. We know that that's the case because of the deep water coming up. Um, there's cave system and uh, Kurt can talk about the cave system and how extensive it is. And I, I really don't know how the building would I mean, I'm sure it would be complicated um, if that answers your question. Yeah, what, whatever you'd like to tell us about water quality at Warm Mineral Springs. Well, I, I want to get back to uh, one of the features of Warm Mineral Springs is it's, I mean, it's highly mineralized. And what attracts people to this spring is the, um, the, the sodium, the chloride, the sulfate, the magnesium, the calcium, 
it's almost like Epsom salts. And with the warm water, people uh, use it as a therapeutic uh, reason. And I think that's something, you know, I don't know, that could attract people more if they knew more about the benefits of this healing water. And maybe, uh, I mean, I'm sure the Dr. Fred Harvey could talk <laughs> about the benefits of the warm mineralized water, but but it is a national treasure. It it is unique with this warm water and the highly mineralized uh, feature that it has. And um, that that was my input about the water quality. Yeah, that's hydrogeologist Patty Metz. We also have Stephanie Gibson on the line, who is watching the city of North Pole and its city government. Um, so th some of the things that I, that I learned from the presentation at the April 10th meeting from the city staff is that the, the fourth, the most intensive um, potential development says that there, um, that the, it eliminates the, the, the option two, which was a less intensive, would eliminate public opposition. It would prohibit P3 public-private partnership resort development, but it does not maximize economic benefit to the city. That option two, I think, was rejected. It, was it rejected in favor of the option four, which was the more intense development? Is that question directed at me, Sean? I, yeah, sure. That would be, that'd be great if you'd like to answer that, Commissioner McDowell. So I, I don't think it's, I don't think option two has been rejected. To me, when you reject something, you say, no, we're not doing this. Um, we have one commissioner, myself, who is in favor of option two. I think if we rejected any of the options, it was option one and option three. Um, my fellow commissioners want to go with option four, which is the most intrusive option out there. Um, the P3, the public-private partnership, is going through negotiations now. City manager and his staff are going through that process. Um, that process is intended to be done confidentiality, uh, confidentially. Um, once they have a something to bring to the commission, the commission has a duty to to look at it and look at everything that it's going to entail. Um, I think we're a long way away from having that document being presented to us. It would be coming in in as form as a contract. It's going to have some additional studies that are being conducted that are underway. Currently, we're going through a survey process. So if anybody's listening, um, go on to the city's website and complete that survey because we do want to hear from everybody, whether you are an environmentalist or pro-development, um, you take the survey. The city manager needs that input so that way then those that information can be shared with the commission. Um, I, I value the input of the 100 or 200 people that came out during the um, War Mineral Springs Master Plan vetting process. That was a very long and arduous process, how we came up with that master plan. That master plan was approved four to one um, back in 2019. And that is, that is what the path was that I thought we were going towards with this P3 until they made their presentation and, and presented their concept plan. And I, I don't begrudge. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. I'm so sorry. Thank you to all of my guests. I want to thank Commissioner McDowell. Debbie McDowell is the commissioner of the city of Northport, geologist Patty Metz, hydrogeologist. Stephanie Gibson is part of City Watch Northport, Florida. And Kurt Bowen is a master photographer, video producer, and has photographed warm mineral springs while scuba diving. And Steve Kosky is a Sarasota County archaeologist with Sarasota County Libraries and Historical Resources and an administrator of Sarasota County's Historic Preservation Ordinance. Thanks to all of my guests for talking about warm mineral springs. If you missed any of this, you can watch it on WMNF.org beginning this afternoon. Tuesday Cafe also airs on the television station TBAE on Tuesdays at 8 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon. I want to thank our phone screener, John Dunn, and thanks also to 
Greg. Well, you've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, News and Public Affairs Director at WMNF Tampa. We'll be back next Tuesday at 10. We'll look back at the eventful 2023 Florida Legislative Session next week. During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint. Next up is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Scherberger. They'll speak with pediatrician Dr. David Berger about the politicization of healthcare decisions from reproductive rights to medical marijuana to transgender teenagers. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on May 16th, 2023 from the studios of WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, Lakeland. Thanks so much for listening.